Now, <clears throat> you should agree and say it with me in this moment that my history will not be my destiny. My history will not be my destiny. I think that's an important concept. Now, Matthew 18, 19 says, if two of you agree, it'll be done. So hopefully that'll work out. My history will not be my destiny. Amen? And I think that's a good way of looking at it. Another way you can say it is, I will not allow the place I grew up to determine who I am now. I will not allow the place I grew up to determine who I am now. Um, in each moment, your life is being influenced and shaped. In each moment, you're given another chance to reinvent yourself. And if you don't believe in that, then if you don't believe people can change, well, then what are you doing at church? I've seen people say, I don't believe anybody changes. Well, what are you doing at church then? You know, what's the point? In each moment, you can rebuild your life and work towards becoming the happy, loving, wonderful person you were born to be, hopefully. In each moment, if you constantly look back with sadness and resentment and regret and forward with fear and worry, you probably fail to realize that each day is a new life and a new opportunity to appreciate and enjoy the life you have. In each moment, if you hold on to your history, it'll cost you your destiny. In each moment, realize that the story of your past does not have to be the story of your life unless you want it to be. In each moment, if you cling to the past and keep using it as an excuse for why you aren't moving on, then your future will be very similar to your past. In each moment, if you give up your past and live in the present and engage with a clear vision of how you want your future to look, then your future will be nothing like your past. In each moment, it's up to you to decide your future as it is really in your hands. In each moment, you make the choice. Now, you all know that I'm a big fan of T.D. Jakes, Thomas Dexter Jakes. And he's, he's two quotes I want to give you. If you run after your destiny, you won't have time to fight with your history. And then he said this, when you hold on to your history, you do so at the expense of your destiny. Steve uh, Maraboli, who is, um, he's still alive, he's a keynote speaker, best-selling author, and a behavioral scientist, he says this, don't let your history interfere with your destiny. Let today be the day you stop being a victim of your circumstances and start taking action toward the life you want. That basically means no matter where you are, you can make it better. It's just about you. Now, I don't know how many of you farmed or planted anything. Some of you dig around your house and plant stuff. Or maybe you just try to keep your grass alive. I don't know. But if you know anything at all, if you've seen anything, if you watch plants a little bit, then you should know this. That yeah, there's some rules about planting and how things come up. But some plants, like some people, defy logic. They come up in spite of all their surroundings and still perform well. And I can't explain that. I mean, it's what we're going to look at tonight, this parable. There are exceptions to this parable. And I think you should cling to the exceptions of the parable. And that's what I want to look at tonight. I'm going to review four starting places or growing up places that when we do not allow the places we grow up to become who we are today or who we're going to be. Here they are. That's it. It's kind of small. hope you can read that. Uh, way, wayside places to grow up, according to the, our text, are devouring places. I'm going to read both texts, verses 3 and 4. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Now, if you're in the text and you're reading with me, drop down to verse 18 now because that's the interpretation of it. Verse 18 says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. 
Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. That is, the birds come and snatch away. So it's a devouring place. This text, the story is like evil birds. The idea is played out in the scriptures over and over again. Wolves or the little foxes or lions. You know, a lion goes out seeking someone to devour, a roaring lion. So there are devouring places, places you don't really want to be. They're not really comfortable. Well, let me tell you, there are people, maybe some sitting around you, who grew up in a devouring place. There are people maybe sitting around you, spiritually, grew up in a devouring place. We do not have to allow the places we grow up to become who we are. You can become spiritual scarecrow people. As uh, 2 Samuel 21, 10, you remember the, the mother of the sons who were killed and she stayed out there for days keeping the birds from eating her children. Do you remember that story from the Old Testament? Well, it's there, 2 Samuel 21, 10. I think you can be that person that prevents the devouring happening. You can be like a scarecrow. You can overcome your devouring place by understanding the word because that's what happens in this text. They did not understand. That's how the birds were able to take it away. That's how the devil was able to snatch it away. That's why it became a devouring place because it's people, there are a lot of, even churches you might say, maybe you grew up in one, where people didn't really understand the Bible. And so that's a devouring place. And so you can overcome your devouring place by literally scaring away the snatching birds. And you need to learn that they're not everybody in your life needs to be in your life. Not everybody needs to be in your life that has been in your life. If you've had a rough coming up, it may be time to break free of some of the people you grew up with, even if you're related to them by blood, to get away from some of the devouring. So the wayside place to grow up are devouring places. The second is the stony places to grow up are scorching places. Now going back, reading uh, Matthew 13, 5 and 6, it says, So some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. So there was some earth on top of the stone. And they immediately sprang up. That's because water would pool on top of the stone. And so it's a natural, more play, easy place for a seed to germinate. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Now, if you drop down to verses 20 and 21, this is the explanation of that that Jesus gives later when they're in the house. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. So it all looks great at first. This is that guy who really looks like he's going to go somewhere as a Christian. Verse 21, yet he has no root in himself, but he endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. There are scorching places. There are scorching places in life in childhood that some have gone through, and they're true in churches. Scorching places are dry places. Dry words are spoken to dry souls. The wells are dry, where you would normally get some refreshment, and the clouds are dry. Jude 1 and verse 12, it says that there are clouds that look like they're going to produce rain, and nothing happens. You can even see sometimes bolts of lightning come out of clouds like that. And they are heavy, looks like, with rain. And they don't even rain. Clouds that don't rain. And he's suggesting that there's such thing as life styles like that. You can be raised like that, where it was a dry place for your soul. Very scorching. But you can also do that in spiritual places. There are churches where it's dry. I mean, just because you go to church, you may have been a member of the Church of Christ for years, but you could have been in a dry, scorching church. Yeah, this idea, well, I was in the Church of Christ, that doesn't mean you were growing. You know, you can sit for years and years in church building and not gain anything. It's up to you to some degree. And we do not have to allow the places we grow up to become who we are. So you can become spiritual sunscreen people. So it's a scorching place you've grown up in. 
Revelation 16, 9, it, it talks about how that the sun gets really bright. It's a pro prophetic thing. And so it scorches the people and they curse and swear, but none of them repent. The truth is, is that if it's a scorching place, maybe that's a good time to repent. Maybe it's a good time to get away from it. You can overcome your scorching places by digging deeper into the Word. So if you're, you're part, and there may be visitors here, if you're a part of a church where it's scorching, uh, I can't fix that church, but I can tell you, if you'll dig into prayer and dig into the Word, you'll make it. Amen? You will make it. And you can do the same thing spiritually speaking. If, if your childhood is a scorching place to grow up, you can dig into the Word and dig into prayer, and you might make it. You may be miserable as a young person, but you can make it. You can overcome your scorching places by preparing for the scorching opposition that's going to come your way. Because if you try to become a good Christian in a home where everybody's not living a good Christian life, you will not get support for that. And some of you grew up in great Christian homes and you got no idea what I'm talking about. You just had it your way. You should have been in mild childhood for a few days. That would given you a different perspective. So stony places to grow up are scorching places. Number three is thorny places to grow up are choking places. It says in verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Now, it's, it's not necessarily the thorn didn't reach over and grab it by the neck. It, it explains it, verses 22, uh, verse 22 specifically. Now, when he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Choking places. That is good things, not necessarily bad things. It's not all, thorns are not representative of all bad things. It's just things that have some bad things on them. I mean, let me give you an example. Is a rose bush a thorn bush? Yeah, it really is. So just because it's a thorn doesn't mean everything about it is bad. So sometimes a very beautiful thing can be a source of choking. So it might be your business. It might be your work. It might be fun fun things that are really good, but if they distract you from the best things, they can end up choking your productivity. It's kind of like Martha and Mary. Mary was cumbered about getting the meal ready, right? Good thing to do. I mean, Martha was, but Mary chose the better part. He, she sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to what he had to say. She, Mary was growing. Martha was just working. And so sometimes we need to recognize that you may be doing a good thing, but it may not be the best thing. And you may be choking your own spirituality down. We do not have to allow the places we grow up to become who we are. So even in a home, if it's a shattering place, if it's a place that truly, I mean, if it's a choking place, you can become a spiritual shattering person. You can get rid of that. You can literally destroy a good thorn bush. You can kill it. You can kill a thorn bush. You can chop it up and get it out of the ground. Amen. Yeah, I mean, how many of you hoed before? Anybody ever hoed here? It's so much fun. I recommend it. Some of you young people should. I mean, it's kind of like snipe hunting, isn't it, guys? Hoeing is wonderful. You should go hoeing. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah, and then go snipe hunting afterwards. All right, so become spiritual shattering people. In Proverbs 24, verses 30 and 31, it talks about how you go by a certain vineyard and you see it overgrown and it's got thorns and all kinds of bushes and everything growing over it. And it says it's a lazy person. So believe it or not, you can chop away your own choking place. You can literally chop away all those thorns if you would. You can overcome your choking place by focusing on on your faith and getting rid of that other stuff. That means you got to focus on sacrifice. you got to sacrifice some things and get it out of your life. Otherwise, you're going to be choked spiritually. Uh, so a thorny place to grow up or choking places. The last point, and I'll hasten to this, and that is good 
places to grow up are yielding places. They're yielding places. That's cooperative. The soil is softer, it's better, it's richer. If you're raised in a good soil place, you ought to thank the Lord. If your mama and your daddy are Christians, you ought to thank Jesus. Amen? I'm telling you, even if they're not great Christians, even if they're not great Christians. Amen? That's just Matthew 13, verse 8. But others fell on good ground and yielded, yielded, gave in to a crop. Some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. In Matthew 13, verse 23, it explains that further. It says, but he who received received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, yielding place is exactly what it suggests. Now, generally speaking, this is what he's talking about. If you take about 10 pounds of wheat, okay, and you sow that into a field, not too big of a field because 10 pounds wouldn't be a very big field. But you put about 10 pounds of wheat out. If you're a thir you get a 30-fold result, you'll get back 30 pounds of wheat. Okay? Well, that's good, but I won't feed you that long, but it will help. You can make some bread out of that. If you put, fold that, if you put that 10 pounds in and it's 60 folds, you get 60 pounds of wheat out of that same area. If you go 10 and you put 100 fold, you put in 10 pounds of wheat and you get out 100 pounds of wheat. Are you following what he's really saying here there? That's the way you look at it with wheat. That's how it grows. And so you can do better if you have better soil. If you fertilize the soil, if you work the soil, you can get better results. You don't have to tweak the gene in the wheat to get it to produce. You just have to water really well and you have to fertilize it. That's the idea of John 15 verse 2 and that is pruning a vine to get it to produce more grapes. We do not have to allow the place we grow up to become who we are. You say, well, I've been in a Christian home. Yeah, but are you a 30-fold? You might could be a 60-fold and you might could be a 100-fold. Are you willing to do the pruning, the hoeing, the fertilizing to get there? Or you just want to blame everything on everybody? I can't help it. This is the circumstance I was born into. This is who I'll always be. I don't believe that. Do you? So become spiritually submissive people. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4, there's a guy named Judas. He was one of 12 and he turned out bad. He didn't have to. But he did. You can turn that around. He was in good soil, right there with the 12, right? But he turned out about you. So yield to your good ground and understand the word and bear fruit. You can't depend on other people to yield your fruit for you. Yield to the good ground and understand the word and then produce. So we're going to be in a time of transition here. Are you going to get on board and help us? Or are you just going to... Make excuses. There's your choice, isn't it? It's not that way just about this building. It's that way about everything. I'm just using that as an example. There are devouring places. There are scorching places. There are choking places. And there are yielding places. And none of them have to turn out that way. Some seed will fall on stony ground and will, or on a pathway and will still come up. Some seed will fall on stony ground and will still come up. Some seed will fall in the middle of thorns and will still come up. And some seed will fall on good ground and die. It doesn't always turn out just because you had the circumstance. So you don't have to yield to your circumstance. We do not have to allow the places we grew up to become the people who we want to be. Amen. Now, you probably know both those people. I would imagine you do. If you don't, I don't know who you are. But uh, uh, just a few stories came out of Oprah Winfrey's show back in 2000. This young lady, uh, young lady named Kelly, I'm not going to show the pictures. You all know that this gentleman was in prison for a very long time and ended up the president of the country. By the way, a great one in my opinion. And I was there. I thought he did a great job. Um, 
But Kelly was survived an abandonment, a plane crash, and leukemia before she was 12 years old. She was left on the side of the road in Vietnam by her parents. Nobody knows who they were, just left her there. She was picked up, and so she stayed in an orphanage until 1975 when Operation Baby Life, a program that was designed to evacuate thousands of babies from Vietnam to be adopted here in America, picked her up, was bringing her to America. The plane crashed and killed 150 passengers. And she's just a, a little one at the time. She said, I really don't know why I was chosen to be one of those survivors. I feel incredibly lucky and I feel like I've gotten a lot of second chances. So she was then adopted by a couple in Seattle, Washington. And then at the age of 11, she was diagnosed with leukemia. But she overcame her disease. And this is what she had to say in 2000. These obstacles that had happened in my life gave me strength and fueled my motivation to live and to succeed and to go on. You do not have to become the sum total of what's happened to you. You can survive and you can go on. Another gentleman named Karen Butler, I don't know if you say it that way, I think it's not Karen Butler, because it's a guy. <laughs> He's an NBA player, I don't actually know the guy, but he's an NBA player. Y'all know who I'm talking about? No? Nobody knows him? NBA player it, it had a, a pretty rough childhood. He grew up on the streets of Racine, Wisconsin. He was arrested 15 times before he was 15 years old. He said, my role models back then were pimps and drug dealers. He ended up in maximum security detention center. And then in that time, he discovered his love for basketball. And it was a turning point while he was locked up in solitary confinement that he went for two weeks that he decided things had to be different. He said, I remember writing my mother letters, so many letters, telling her how much I loved her and if I was to get out, I would never, ever hurt her again. It was from this moment I knew that I could do anything in life. After prison, he returned back to high school and enrolled again in high school. He joined the basketball team. He got a basketball scholarship to the University of Connecticut, and he became one of the star players on the team. Karen then had a successful career in the NBA. You ever heard of Eli Vessel? He was a Jewish guy. Uh, he is an author, a scholar. He was a part of the Holocaust. He survived it. At age 15, he and his family were deported to, by the Gestapo to Auschwitz death camp. And he separated from his parents. So he endured virtual starvation, torture, disease, and then the death of everybody that he loved. Everybody in his family died except him. And Oprah said that the most miraculous part of his life is not that he survived, but that he went on to live without hating those people. And he said... The anger here is in me, hate is not. He's angry about what they did, but he doesn't hate them. He said, I write and I teach, and therefore I believe anger must be a catalyst to do better. So you decide. It isn't what's happened to you, okay? It isn't where you've been that decides your fate. It's who you decide to be. That's the message of this lesson tonight. My history will not be my destiny. Say it with me. My history will not be my destiny. I will not allow the places I grew up to determine who I am. No matter how we started, we, with whatever disadvantages you feel like you had, you do not have to go there because heaven can be yours. Amen? It can all turn out better than you've ever imagined in your life with heaven as your goal. If you're here tonight and you don't know for sure that heaven is where you're going, let's, let us help you. We haven't talked a lot about that tonight, that you need to hear the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins and give your life to Him. Make Him Lord of your life. 
And you need to confess that faith and then you need to be baptized. Those sins will be washed away. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can turn your life around tonight and we will help you do that. But you may need more explanation. You may need to talk to someone afterwards. Or maybe you need to come back to the Lord. But don't wait. If you need it, remember this. No matter what's happened in your life, my history does not have to be my destiny. Won't you come if you need to while we stand and while we sing?